Magazines that exist to disseminate scientific findings to the public, uh, such as, is Natural History still in existence or did it disappear? It used to be a great magazine and then it went nuts even before everyone else went nuts or it went uninteresting. As far as I know, it's still. Okay. Well, Natural History, Discover, Scientific American, these are um, Omni. Is that a magazine? I make that up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was was never as much in my my world. But those, those first three, like we got those in my house when I was growing up. Uh, and they were, you know, they were understood to be the ways that scientifically interested people uh, can keep up on scientific findings, either outside of their own fields if they're scientists, or outside of, you know, or they're not scientists but they're scientifically capable and interested and literate and want to want to know what's what's what. Yeah, it was the popular presentation yeah. of actual scientific discovery. Exactly, and there, you know, there was. There was some controversial stuff, and there sure. were things that you know you might disagree with because that's the way science works, uh, and um, and there are also interpretations of things. You know whether or not the the finding um, turns out to be true or not, the interpretation of it uh, may separately uh, not not be the right interpretation. Um, but Scientific American has, I mean, long since jumped all the sharks. <laughs> it feels like not that that's a thing, uh, but here. Here we have, uh, here I'll put up their tweet before, actually, yeah, you can, you can just put this. This is, again, I picked this up from Twitter where I quote tweet Scientific American and what Scientific American has said is this. Before the late 18th century, hopefully that's not playing. Okay. Before the late 18th century, Western science recognized only one sex, the male, and considered the female body an inferior version of it. The shift historians call the two-sex model served mainly to reinforce gender and racial divisions by tying social status to the body. True facts about the male. <laughs> so you know, what, what I said in response, which is, you know, it's an understatement, wherein a scientific publication forgets that reality exists whether or not humans perceive it accurately. The idea that because... that because science didn't understand everything about the universe at some point... There must not have been a reality then, and our confusion now can take precedence, and we can use confusion from earlier to cement confusions now is truly backwards. And like I just I keep on coming back to the Fermi paradox and thinking like this is it. This is this is the kind of society ending confusion that keeps us from ending up making contact with other conscious beings in the universe. Because if this then there's there's no amazing space exploration for us. Like we can't do it. We can't do it if we think these things. Right. Um, yes. The colonizing of other planets will be uh, much more difficult if we have not at least ensured that yeah. people from the two actual genuine sexes who are still of reproductive age have arrived in these places capable of producing offspring. Um, yeah. But I would just point out that even you know who amongst us does not in their own mind have rock solid evidence that people have been aware of the sexual binary for two plus thousand Ever. years, right? <laughs> two plus thousand, wow. Okay. Well, I'm just saying if the idea that it is, this was discovered in the 1880s, 18 somethings, I don't know. Let's make it the 1880s. Shall Something <laughs> okay. like the 1880s, right? The average person hmm. knows that. The Old Testament, for example, contains a certain number of references to the two sexes, suggesting that people that far back already had become aware of this this binary. Yeah. Right? So how is it that Scientific American... And really, I think we need a new category because the purpose there is not to convince anybody of this, nor is this the product of anything that even rises to the level of a confusion, Mm -hmm. right? The purpose of this is if you wish to deny the absolutely obvious and incontrovertible fact of two human sexes, Mm -hmm. then you're going to need something to work with. In other words, there comes the point in the conversation where you wish to assert that there are not two sexes, and the person on the other side of the argument says, hopefully in a respectful way, you're completely full of shit. And then you need to say the next thing, right, <laughs> about why you're not full of shit. And so the 
purpose <laughs> of this is to have that next thing in hand and to have it come from a respectable place like Scientific American, mm. because then the person who has called you out for your garbage thinking mm -hmm. is then back on their heels. They may not have a next thing, in which case you win and there are no longer two sexes. <laughs> That's right. That's right, because that's how reality works, guys. <laughs> that is how reality. That's how reality works, works and yeah. that's why we'll never meet aliens. Wait, wait, wait. That is how reality has always worked. Now I need Scientific American to give me the piece that oh I God. say when you call me out for being full of shit. I'm sure they're coming with it. Well, no doubt. I'm sure they will. So actually, th this strikes me. It hadn't occurred to me before, um, but during your your brief tirade there, <laughs> I thought about quaddies. And so Quatis, C-O-A-T-I, um, also known as Quatamundis, are a neotropical, that is to say, uh, the tropics in the New World, in the Americas, Procyonid, which is a relative of the raccoon. They are, they're gorgeous. They're snouty and they're brown and they've got some stripes farther back. Not, not as stripey as the raccoon. No. Um, more brown, they're, um, they're forest dwellers. Um, they climb okay, like raccoons climb okay. And they're just, they're, they're quite lovely. The, I think the first time we ran into them, and you've actually got a picture of me sitting next to one, yes. and it was in Monteverde in, uh, in Costa Rica in the cloud forest on the, the first summer that we spent backpacking through Central America. It was near the end of our trip. Um, but what we heard, I believe, on that trip for the first time, uh, and we've heard it since, although because I had hadn't occurred to me. I have not gone back and looked into the research here. What we heard then was that when researchers first, when Western researchers were first under discovering the Quatamundi, the Quatamundi presumably having long since discovered itself <laughs> as the original human inhabitants of these forests having long since discovered them. But when Western science came in and was like, aha, I have found it. Eureka, the Quatamundi. It uh, won't exist until it has a Latin name. It won't exist until it has a Latin name, such as the nature of science and reality, apparently. Uh, but now when, when the Quatamundi was discovered, I don't know, this is maybe in the 1880s, um, <laughs> you know, you know, early 20th century, mid 20th century something. Uh, it was thought that there were two species because one of them, uh, which was, I don't remember, but I'm going to guess maybe a little bit larger body was always seen um, singly. And it was like, oh, wait, did you see it? That was a, I think that was maybe called the quaddy. That was the quaddy. Quaddy. And then there were these like aggregates. There were these ones that always had little ones with them and they had a lot of bigger ones and they were called the mundies, I guess. And as it turns out, the mundies were the females with their babies and they were social because often females with babies are. And the quaddies uh, were the males that were solitary and a polygynous mating system and it all fits together now that we have a better understanding of mating systems and biology and no that doesn't change the underlying reality about what quadis or quadamundis are but it does mean that science got it wrong science got it wrong and then through a, an experiment in which they checked the junk of the <laughs> quadis and quadamundis they discovered which being their being procyonids being raccoon relatives was not too easy it of was a, a task yeah. yeah it was a it was a they got scratched up mm -hmm. no doubt but um yeah and boy the nsf grant for that junk checking in <laughs> quadis <laughs> i think it had a different title but anyway it's not the only story of this kind in fact the elephant seal went through the same thing um, so there are two species of elephant seal, and I forget which one it was. But the, the thing is that morphologically, elephant seals are so different. Males and females are so different in size and also facial structure. The males uh, are even uglier than the females, which if you've ever seen a female elephant seal, you might find difficult to believe. But no, take a look at a male, even uglier. Yeah, a lot of, a mm -hmm. lot of uh, resonating bulbous, chamber. Bulbous yeah. nasal stuff going on. Um, but anyway, they were understood to be different species until, again, a junk checking experiment uh, revealed the truth. I want to know what division of NSF that is, like where you apply for the NSF grant for junk it's checking. It's right next door to navel gazing. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, and it's these ex departments are expanding. They're taking over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently. Taking over the whole NSF.